Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter number 31 this morning. Proverbs chapter number 31. Once again, let me say happy Mother's Day to all of our moms out there. If I didn't catch you earlier, happy Mother's Day. What better place to be than in the church house on Mother's Day, amen? Today we set aside a special time each year to honor our godly moms. And if you are a godly mom uh, this morning, your price, according to the word of God, is far above rubies. And so, you know, in law enforcement, also in ministry, I, I've had the displeasure of meeting many moms that are not honorable. Uh, moms that did not care for their children, did not do the things that moms are supposed to do, not godly in any way, shape, or form. And, and I can remember many of those moms like that when I was dealing with them in law enforcement, also in ministry at different times throughout my time in ministry. And Simply giving birth to a child in no way makes you an honor-worthy mom. Being a mom who is worthy of being honored by her family is dependent on the mom's actions, amen. Not simply because of bearing children. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that childbirth and the pains that it bring was a consequence placed upon all women by God for Eve's sinfulness. Remember? Uh, sometimes we forget about those things, but so the act of becoming a mom through bearing children is not necessarily an honor in and of itself. Now, before you start tuning me out, just hang on for a minute. Bear with me for a few moments and let me say this. The Bible teaches us that a good wife comes before a good mom. Let me say that again. A good wife comes before being a good mom. As a matter of fact, being a good wife comes before you're even married. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Uh, the problem that our society is facing today is that young women are no longer being taught how to be a good wife. As a matter of fact, in many cases, they're not being taught much at all about what God's word says about how to be a godly young lady. Godly young ladies turn into godly wives and godly wives turn into godly moms. And Titus tells us that it's the responsibility of the aged women to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. How do they do this? Well, first of all, the aged women are to, become, are to be in behavior as becometh godliness. Or becometh holiness, I should say. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And you cannot effectively teach those things if you're not living those things yourself. Amen. It's not a matter of do as I say, not as I do. We need to do both. We need to be able to teach and we also need to be able to live with example. So in a sense, it's not solely the responsibility of the young women that they're not being prepared how to be a good wife. A godly Christian woman is to be a discipler of younger women, teaching them what they need to know and how to be a godly wife, amen. If you are a godly mom and you have a daughter, you have been given the responsibility to first teach your daughter how to be a godly young lady and then a godly wife. Now in fairness, many godly moms have taught their daughters some of these biblical principles. However, many daughters have decided to go their own way and go the way of the world rather than follow mom's teaching. And that's a shame when that happens. Instead of heeding mom's godly advice, they tend to listen to friends and the world's system of doing things. And listen, simply following social media and all the influencers that are on that will not get you across the finish line as a good wife or a godly mom. What will get us across the finish line is when we hear the voice of God saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is what will be, uh, this is what will, uh, will be how much of the word of God we apply to our lives and how much we teach others to do the same thing. This is what will get us across the finish line with 
those praises from God. I'm not a fan of messages preaching about holidays and things like that. My wife will tell you uh, certain holidays, uh, you know, tailoring message to certain holidays. I just I have never felt that very comfortable with that. But the origin of Mother's Day, as we know it, took place in the early 1900s. A woman named Anna Jarvis started a campaign for an official holiday honoring mothers in 1905, the year her own mother passed away. The first larger scale celebration of the holiday was in 1908, when Jarvis held a public memorial for her mother in her hometown of Grafton, West Virginia. And over the next few years, Jarvis pushed to have the holiday officially recognized, and it was celebrated increasingly in more and more states around the U.S., but in finally in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson signed a proclamation making Mother's Day an official holiday to take place the second Sunday of May. Anna Jarvis put Mother's Day on the calendar as a day dedicated to expressing love and gratitude to mothers, acknowledging the sacrifices that women make for their children. That's why she was determined to keep mothers with the apostrophe S, a singular possessive as marked by the apostrophe before the S. That is why I said in the beginning of the message, not all mothers are worthy of being celebrated. In the book of Proverbs, I asked you to turn there in the beginning, chapter number 31, we find the following instructions from a mom to her son. Who better to give advice than a mother to her son with regard to godly women and godly moms, godly wives? Oh, that all moms would be in a position, both physically, spiritually, to teach their young sons what it is to be desired in finding a godly wife. The qualities you should look for, the behavior of a godly young lady, what does it look like? You know, when we were raising Alyssa years ago, I remember Anne Marie telling her to prayerfully make a list of godly qualities or attributes that she should desire in the man she was to marry. Prayerfully make the list, give it to God, and then do not settle for anything less. I think that's pretty good advice. What a novel idea, amen? Men, you can do the same thing. Of course, we know that today most young men and young women, unfortunately, look for physical attraction first. But you know the old saying, beauty is only skin deep. And by the way, that goes both ways for men and for women. That person that you marry today will be the same person that they're going to be five years from today, ten years from today. And you're going to still be married to them, amen. So be careful how you choose. There's a great deal of beautiful women in the world but if they do not love God, they will most likely bring any young man that they marry to heartache. It's important for young ladies and for young men to desire God and to uh, have a great uh, heart's desire to serve God. And so let's look and see what mom's advice here in Proverbs 31 is for her young son. In Proverbs 31.1, we see the young son's name, Lemuel, which means the one belonging to God. So this mom knows full well Proverbs chapter 31, verse 1, the words of King Lamel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So this mom knows full well by the name of her son that she has raised her son to be sound spiritually and to know God. And, you know, the greatest virtue moms can still instill in their children's lives is to obey God, to obey her authority as a mom and to also obey dad. Uh, hey, we need to teach children, first of all, right out of the blocks at a very young age, to obey authority. Uh, that is a critical thing. If they don't learn how to be, obey authority at a young age, uh, it's probably a pretty good chance they're not going to turn out very well. When mom gives a command to a son or a daughter, they need to obey immediately. And so if they don't obey, then they're disobedient. And so we want to make sure that we teach our children that. But the greatest virtue that we can instill as parents is to teach our children to obey the authority that dad has been given by God, what mom has been given by God. There's no concrete biblical evidence here, by the way, that Lemuel, uh, who Lemuel was, we don't really know much about this person. We just simply know that in Proverbs 31, mom gave him some advice on how to choose 
a, a virtuous woman, a godly woman. Notice verse 2, she said, What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. We see here in this verse the heart of a mother for her son, making reference to the fact that before he was ready to find a wife, he was first her little child, her baby. He was first the child of her and her husband. The obvious love that she has for him comes out in verse number two. Verse three, notice this. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. You know, one of the number one things in homes today that destroys homes faster than anything else is when the man, the father, the husband of the relationship gives away his strength unto his wife or the woman. I'm telling you, folks, this is one of the, the number one problems that we see in marriages today uh, where the roles that have God given, God gave the role to a husband and he gave the role to a wife. And when those two roles are not respected and kept, it brings a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache to the home. Numbers of homes have been destroyed throughout history by the, re, by the uh, violation of this one action. And so she tells her son, uh, don't give away, don't give away your strength as a man to your wife. Uh, that's not what God wants. Uh, men allowing their wives to be the leader in a home is only going to bring problems. Wives, if you've slipped into that role in your home, you had better give it back. Give back that role quickly to your husband. God will not hold you guiltless if you're the authority in the home and you're constantly telling your husband how to do this and how to do that and what they should do, what they shouldn't do. That is not your responsibility according to the word of God. Men, if you've given that away out of convenience or laziness, you better step up and be the man God wants you to be. If you're a single mom, God understands you must take care of your family, and I, I get that as well. Drop down, to, we're in chapter uh, 31, verse 3, but just with me real quick, let's drop down. We won't have time to go over all of these verses this morning, but I want you to see verse number 10. Drop down to verse number 10. Here's where we begin to see the qualities that mom tells uh, her young son to, to look for in a woman. Verse number 10, the Bible says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The word virtuous in that text means morally good, acting in accordance with the moral law, practicing the moral duties. However, simply doing a few moral duties every once in a great while does not make one virtuous. Instead, in order to be considered virtuous, one must be displaying a pattern of consistent moral performance. If that is true, then a woman's price is far above rubies. If you're constantly a mom who continually practices these virtues and makes them a part of their life and, and can't get by without keeping these rules and, and these, uh, these virtues that God has given us in his word, then you are a virtuous woman and your price is far above rubies. What qualifies? Uh, so what, then what qualities do we find in a person or a woman who is virtuous? Young men, listen, a virtuous woman is searched for not settled for. Did you see verse number 10? Who can find a virtuous woman? That means that you got to search. To find something, you have to search, amen. What does it mean to search? It means, in this context, it means that there's some things that should be present when you're looking. And when you find that person or find that virtuous woman that you will marry, then that means simply that there's some things in this woman or the qualities in this woman that match some of the things that God's word says ought to be there. Amen. And what we oftentimes see, young men get taken by a lot of young women because of their beauty. I understand. But let me just say this to you. If you want a virtuous woman, then she should have virtuous qualities as you're searching. And when you find her, you'll know. Amen. Let's look at the only infallible source on what a virtuous woman is and, and, and uh, uh, what we see here the Bible tells us. We won't have time, like I said, to go over every one of these verses, but let's just sample a couple. Look at verse 11. The Bible says here, this gives us one of the most important qualities that a truly virtuous woman should possess. Verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have uh, need, uh, no need of spoil. You see that? Can I say this? Trust and confidence in a person has, has been said it takes many years to gain that. 
And that confidence and trust can be lost in an instant with one bad decision. Confidence in a person, trust in a person is built up over time. And let's just face it, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. However, during the, the counseling sessions that I've had over the years with married couples, one of the reoccurring themes in many marital problems is simply trust. In other words, husbands don't trust their wives to do certain things. Wives don't trust their husbands to do certain things. And that's a problem because we should be able to trust our wife. We should be able to trust our husband. That doesn't mean that one person doesn't trust the other to remain devoted physically necessarily, but in some cases that's true. But the bigger reason for the lack of trust is the trust associated with everyday things under one's control. Let me give you an example. Wives ask husband to bring home medication on their way home from work for the sick child. Husband gets home, wife walks into the house, husband or the wife says to the husband, where's little Clarabelle's medication? And the husband, with a dumb look on his face, I completely forgot to pick it up. Now that's a silly example, but it, it sounds insignificant. But let me just say this, but enough of these things, guys, will cause our wives to not trust us with the, uh, with the bigger things. See, trust is earned, and, and uh, when you remember when you were a child and your parents would give you little tasks to do, and if you did them, then you were praised for doing what you were told to do. But if you also did not do those things, then you were sometimes chastised by your parents for not doing them, and trust is built up over time. And many times, wives are more tuned into the little details of life, and husband just kind of passes over a lot of those things. But the Bible says a virtuous woman can be trusted by her husband. She can be counted on. There's a lot of ladies that do not fit in that category. It's unfortunate. Husbands go to work and they have to worry about what's going to take place when they're gone, and that ought not be the case. A husband needs to be able to trust his wife. Husbands do not leave the house and wonder what the wife is up to because there's no, uh, because there's no trust involved in the relationship. Let me add this, nowhere in the Bible that I know of do we find an admonition for men to get their wives straight. Nowhere. By the way, nowhere in the Bible do we find an admonition for wives to get their husbands straight. Instead, what we do find is we as individuals are supposed to be so focused on perfecting our own spiritual life that we, can, we can't help but, uh, but be what we should be if we're doing that. In other words, if your desire every day is to live for God and to study God's word and to have time of devotion in the word of God and prayer time in your, in your private time, in your private place, if your time is, is, is spent doing that and trying to grow spiritually as a wife or as a husband, consequently, guess what? You're going to be a better wife and a better husband. Because you're going to be reading and knowing and understanding some of the principles in the Word of God that you need to understand. Let's face it, more people are, are not influenced for Christ because of us. Come on now. Hey, there's people that watch Pastor Glenn and they're not influenced for Christ because Pastor Glenn is not all that he should be in, in Christ. And the same is true for you, by the way. Your halos are crooked. But that's the truth. You know what happens? Children tend to repeat what they see their parents do. And if their parents aren't given to the word of God and they're not given to scripture and they're not given to devotion time, guess what? The kids probably won't be either. In 1918, one in 33 marriages ended in divorce. One in 33. In 1998, one in two ended in divorce. We're not headed in the right direction, folks. The divorce rates among professing Christians is now higher than the general population. That is a sad, sad commentary. And I believe it's because uh, we're not following the principal teaching of the word of God as we go to the wedding altar or as we go through life in general. Look at verse 12. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She will do him good. 
Sometimes it seems like women just don't have their husband's best interest at heart. Sometimes it seems as though there is a constant animosity between husbands and their wives. And it works both ways. Sometimes husbands seem to fully dis- fully uh, directed to make their life, the, the wife's life miserable, and that ought not to be the case. But the Bible says here, a virtuous woman, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. I've met women in ministry that have been through counseling with us, and, and they have nothing good to say about their husband. It can't be all that way. There's got to be something, otherwise you would have never married him. And so we, we read these things and we see these things and, 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 and we have to understand if you make it a habit of doing evil to your husband, ladies, then you are going to pay a price. Mark it down. Verse 13, the Bible says here uh, in verse 13, See, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. A virtuous woman is not a lazy woman. And sometimes, I'm just telling you, I've known women that just sit home all day and do nothing. Husband comes home from work in the afternoon after working a day and and there's nothing on the table to eat, nothing prepared. That ought not be the case. Here she says, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. The Proverbs 31 woman, as a matter of fact, makes the clothes for the family. That's a far cry from our society, amen? Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I thank God for Marshalls, TJ Maxx, amen. Verse 14, she is like the merchant's ships that bringeth her food from afar. What I get from this is that uh, her meals that she makes are not the same thing every night, after night, after night, after night. There's a variety and there's, a, there's an interest uh, that, uh, that this virtuous woman has in preparing for their husband a lot of good things and good food. Hey, men, hey, you know, they say that the, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Amen. If, if you're a virtuous woman, you know how to make sausage gravy and biscuits and chicken with gravy. Amen. Mashed potatoes and meatloaf and gravy and more gravy and more gravy. Amen. It's not that good for you, I know. It just tastes so good. Yeah, and vegetables. Verse 14, she is like the merchant ship, bringing her food from afar. Verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Hey, listen, I don't know too many wives these days that have... have, uh, uh, the ability to uh, get up in the morning and make breakfast for their husband before he's off to work at 6 o'clock in the morning. But that used to be the case, eh, Ben? What's changed? I'm not really sure. Every home is a little bit different. But we see some of the qualities here in chapter 31 of what a virtuous woman looks like. Notice she riseth early. She doesn't lay a bed till 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and then get up and eat lunch at breakfast or eat breakfast at lunchtime and watch soap operas for the rest of the afternoon. Look at verse 17. We'll skip. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Uh, This, I think, means that a woman should take care of herself physically, both morally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all those things. It's, It's important, by the way, that we all do that. Uh, Not just uh, women, but men also should take care of themselves. But that doesn't mean, ladies, listen, when it says that she girdeth her loins with strength, it doesn't mean that you have permission to beat your husband up. You laugh, but sometimes that happens. I can remember talking to a lot of families down in the South that husband would confess to me, I'm afraid of my wife. She's beat me up several times. I don't understand that, but that's what they've said. Women are never to use their strength, listen, in a way to circumvent the husband's God-given authority and role. Uh, This this verse 17 about girding loins with strength doesn't mean that a woman is to take over and 
set the, the husband aside and just go ahead and, and, and uh, take the role that's been given to the husband to themselves. And uh, there's a place, there's a role for every woman that's godly. And according to this passage of scripture here, I believe God makes that clear. Sorry to tell you, Joyce Meyer, God doesn't want you preaching to men either. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. And here it is, listen guys, giving honor unto thy wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know, I believe one of the reasons that our prayers aren't answered many times is because they're hindered. If you have sin in your life, if, if you have things in your home that are out of order according to God's word, then your prayers will be hindered. We just read there very clearly that that's what happens when we don't do things the way God wants them to be done. Look at verse 23, Proverbs 31, verse 23. The Bible says, Her husband is known in the gates. When he sitteth among the elders of the land. Why? Because the virtuous woman makes sure her husband looks his best when he leaves the home. What does that mean? Most Sundays, when I get ready to come to church, I always pop into where my wife is getting ready for church, and she sees what I've done as far as dress is concerned. And you know what happens sometimes? She'll say, that looks awful. (laughs) Or, you're wearing that? And that's code for change your clothes. My wife is is a very good, diligent wife about ironing my clothes. She doesn't let me go out of the house with a wrinkled shirt. But there's some wives that could care less if their husband go out with a wrinkled shirt. Notice in that verse it says there that her husband is known in the gates. Husbands, you don't want to be known in the gates or the place where all the decisions are made. Oh, here comes the guy with a wrinkled shirt. Amen. Look at verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, there's some husbands, when they take their wife out to any public place, and they get around a bunch of people, they never know what the wife is going to say. She never has to, in other words, the husband never has to worry about his wife having a bad reputation because she keeps her words and her attitude under godly control. I'm just telling you, that's a critical thing. Some women are loose cannons with their mouths. Men stand back and let them say whatever comes to their wife's mind to whomever is present at the time. They don't dare correct them afterwards when it's appropriate. But I'm just telling you, folks, God's word in the book of Titus tells us that women are supposed to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's pretty straightforward stuff. Proverbs 31, verse 28, Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Here's a valuable truth that's been lost in our modern society. Children don't praise their mother anymore. Many times they ignore her. Uh, Many times the the mother has no honor in their own home because dad has not taught the children to respect mom. That's a tragedy. Children in this chapter on a virtuous woman are not mentioned specifically until verse 28. Did you notice that? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and he praiseth her. Society has turned the word of God on its head with regard to rearing children. In modern homes in America, children are idolized. In modern homes today, the Bible is no longer an infallible book on how to raise godly kids. 
Instead of chores, children now have no chores. And instead they have lots of activities. Now it is the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental health disorders that is the guide. Instead of the Bible. Parents are trusting their child's future on a complete ungodly realm of psychobabble laced with prescription mind-altering medication that will never fix a behavioral problem. The reason why society is so upside down in this area of raising godly kids is because schools now have a therapist practically in every location. Or they have access to a therapist. But that's not what it should be. Moms are the ones responsible for the most part of training up their children. If dad is at work, mom has the authority to train up their child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. That's what the Bible teaches. But finally, in Proverbs 30 and first, uh, chapter 31, verse 30 and 31, notice it says, Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Did you see that? Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Here God's word says that women know how to use their faculties. I remember when I was in Bible college, we had a, a, a man that came and used to teach at the school. And, and uh, he had this saying, he would say to some of the young men on the campus that were not married and they were looking around the campus at the, the ladies, the young ladies that were there in school as well. And he would say every once in a while, Watch out for that one. She knows how to use her faculties. And I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to figure out what I'm saying. But that was his admonition to them. Beauty is vain. That's what the Bible says right there. But remember that youthful beauty will one day be gone. It happens to all of us. Eventually that hourglass, guys, is going to turn into a pear. <laughs> Instead, though, what does the Bible say? A woman who trusts and feareth God, she is to be praised. That's what verse 30 says. Young Christian men, listen to me. There's not many here, but just listen anyway. You can tell a young man about this. If you want to avoid a long life, a long life of heartache, don't dare marry a young lady just for her looks. If she doesn't love and fear the Lord like you do, you are headed for a long, hard life. Young ladies, the same advice goes for you. If you don't find a young man who loves God the way you do and wants to serve God and be careful to follow the word of God, and you go ahead and settle for some slug of a, a, slug of a young man, the Bible calls him a fool, if they don't love God and heed his word, you're going to be ready for a long, hard, long, hard life. Verse 31, give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Men, if your wife does well in managing the home, taking care of you and taking care of the things that we've already talked about as duties prescribed by God's word, See, listen, see that she gets rewarded properly. You know, there's a lot of men. And if you're one of these, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it anyway. Don't be a cheapskate. Yeah. Ladies, can you say amen right there? Amen. Don't be a cheapskate. If your wife has earned and done her work well, then you need to be rewarded. or She needs to be rewarded. Let her do some things that she enjoys to do. Let her get some things that she enjoys having. There's nothing wrong with that. The old saying goes, if you treat her like a queen, she'll treat you like a king. Let her always be rewarded, not by her words, but by how she makes you joyful and you let her know that. Because you know you've found a virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies. Amen. Amen. 
Would you stand with me for a word of prayer? Father in heaven, thank you once again for just these simple instructions. Lord, we're thankful that that we have godly moms. We're thankful for moms who have been loyal, competent, trustworthy, loving, caring, nurturing for many years. And Lord, I know for my own self, that's the kind of mom I had. And many others here have had the same thing. And Father, we don't say enough how grateful we are. And Father, we ask this morning that you would speak to each heart that's here. And if there's something that needs to be done in this area of thanking mom or just letting her know how much you appreciate her, Lord, we pray that you would send a convicting, a convicting spirit on that one. And Lord, for those who are here that uh, no longer have the ability to speak to mom directly, they can surely speak to you in prayer and tell you how thankful they are for the time that you gave them with their mom. And Father, I pray this morning for that one that's here, that's, uh, Lord, just uh, yearning and hurting, or uh, maybe, Lord, just desiring that they could uh, just spend more time with their mom, but it's just not possible. But Father, we know this. You have every lady's heart and mind in this place this morning, first and foremost in your thoughts. Not because it's Mother's Day, but because every day, that's the way you look at your kids. And so help us, Father, we pray this morning as we have our hymn of invitation that you do a work and we'll be careful to thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.